Welcome to the Ancient Coin Podcast with Aaron Burke, a show about ancient coins from the viewpoint of a seasoned professional with nearly 30 years experience. Here's Aaron Burke and Mike Nottleman on the Ancient Coin Podcast. And the sound of the gong once again means it's time for another episode of the Ancient Coin Podcast with Aaron Burke. I'm Mike Nottleman. I'm Aaron Burke. That means he's Aaron Burke. Uh, quick background to the podcast. Aaron and his dad own a pretty well-known shop where I work as a U.S. numismatist. I've always wanted to learn more about ancient coins. And since I have two, if not more, of the foremost authorities on ancient coins in, the, in America right here, I asked Aaron if he'd teach me about ancients. So through these podcasts, we have an opportunity where you can learn with me. They're available on our website at hjbltd.com so that you can access them at your own leisure. So let's see. On episode number 14 of the Ancient Coin Podcast, we have yet another pearl for our necklace of wisdom from Aaron, uh, which hopefully makes you a smarter coin buyer. Um, the summer lull is kind of hitting the, the auction circuit, but we have some goodies to bring you. And uh, let's see. No doofus purchase this week, but uh, but lots of fun. So what do you have for me tonight, Aaron? So, you know, the summer months are before COVID, and this is kind of what I'm seeing at the moment. It's really hard to know what the market is doing it right now, because if you go pre-COVID, summers for ancient coins were very slow. Um, our our walk-in business for our store was always much better in the summer because people are traveling to Chicago uh, and just people are out and about. And so our walk-in is usually really good. Our walk-in stinks in January, February because people just uh, want, and especially in downtown the Chicago. Sucks. Okay. Right. And so our summer, you know, our summer months for for the ancient coin market was usually slow. But the last few years, because of COVID. We had great summers uh, because people were at home, they weren't traveling and they had money to spend and they were home. So, um, and so I think what we're seeing here, here right now is a little bit of a lull uh, because people are away, they're on vacation, they're doing what they used to do. And there are no major auctions, uh, public auctions going on during the summer. It's usually gonna be in the spring, the fall, and then of course, during the New York International in December. And so, some people have been talking about the fact that inflation might be bringing down the market a bit. It's really hard to tell at this point. And uh, the summer isn't going to be the, the, the best way to figure that out at the moment. I think we have to wait until the fall to really get a good feel to really what the overall auction is going to be, auction season is going to be, and what the market, where the market's going to be. Well, wait until the traditional business season kicks in and then make your predictions. Don't try and judge it by the dead season. <clears throat> Exactly. And so there's no doofus purchases because it's really just all e-sales right now. There are some uh, some mail bid sales out there, uh, some catalogs out there. And normally I wouldn't talk about my company because, I, you know, when Mike and I decided to do this podcast, it wasn't really, you know, to promote Harlan Burke all the time. We have promoted the company in certain ways and philosophies, but it isn't always really to push material. But in saying that, we actually have our auction that's a printed catalog that's closing next Thursday. So I think we need to talk about it. Let's talk about it. So um, now our catalogs, if you're not familiar, are much different than most auction catalogs. We do what's called a buy or bid sale, which my father was the first in the industry to actually do a buy or bid sale, which he'd started in 1980. Uh, we've been in the business since 64, but before that he did fixed price lists. And then in 1980, he came up with a buyer bid sale, which means in a sense, it's a fixed price list until the last day. And then we take offers below our asking price. And if you're the highest offer that we accepted and no one else has bought the piece, then you get it at your price that we both agreed on as acceptable and you don't pay any buyer's fees on top of that. It's just, that's what you pay. And so we will never sell a coin over our buy price. That can get us into trouble because, or maybe we're leaving money on the table because in these day, this day and age, a lot of, there's a lot of runaway prices with auctions. 
Uh, but here, I think it's, it's a great way for people to get good price points because they can either buy it outright, own it immediately, or they can take a chance and buy it for far less than the buy price. So uh, I wanted to point out uh, four pieces that are in the current sale. And the first one is lot two. Scared. And <clears throat> yeah, so this is, uh, you know, near the beginning of coinage. So this was, uh, this was in, you know, minted between 500 and 460 BC in the city of Kizikis, which was in modern day Turkey, where coinage actually uh, started in uh, 750 BC. So um, uh, this particular one has a Sphinx. And what's really remarkable about this one is if you look at other Sphinx types for this uh, particular issue, they're usually much cruder. This one actually is very well done. It's the finest known by a long shot. And because it's the finest known, it was published in both 100 Greatest Ancient Coin Books on the coinage of Kizikis. So this was actually the plate coin in, in both uh, volume one and volume two of the 100 greatest, which means it was the finest one that my father could find to print in his book. So this has an NQs on the reverse and it has a Sphinx on the obverse. Um, it, it's really detailed. It is well detailed for... And, yeah, and you see that line that's underneath the legs of the Sphinx? Yeah, well, it looks to be maybe the ground. It's not. It's a it's a tunny fish, which is basically a tuna. Oh, and so and that is the symbol for Kizikis. Okay. And so most of the Kizikis coins will have a fish below, uh, uh, called a tunny fish, and um, the most of the early coins of uh, most electrum coins of these early periods are all done with the NQs. And so that's pretty common. And they're generally all done in Electrum, which is a gold silver mix. And so they were actually, it was once thought that they came out of the ground that way, um, but it's not the case anymore. We know that they were actually uh, spreading out the gold by mixing in silver. And so you can get from very yellowy looking uh, Electrum pieces to silvery, depending on how much silver they put into it. So in essence, they're debasing it. Right, right. Or just spreading their gold out. So I guess debasing is what we would say. So um, <clears throat> you can see now, just again, to explain the buyer bid, uh, this as an estimate, you could buy it at $32,500, $3,500, or you can bid 26000 which in this case, I believe is the reserve. We actually have it on consignment from a client. And so that's going to cover... Um, uh, our commission, as well as uh, what the client is wishing to get. It's it's a great way. Um, uh, I'm not going to toot completely, but uh, you know, a lot of clients that we have, they want the coins protected, um, and so we're able to protect the coins uh, as from selling too cheap. Now you're not going to get a runaway price because maybe this coin in an auction brings fifty thousand dollars. Who knows? Um, but it also could bring $10,000. So here we protect it for the client and that's the beauty of the buyer bid sale. So moving on, uh, we're gonna go to lot nine, which is the Pertinax Aureus. Gold. Yeah. And so uh, last time, the last podcast we had, we talked about Pupiinus and we talked about the six emperors that reigned in the single year. Well, this uh, Pertinax is in a similar situation. Uh, there was five emperors that all reigned in uh, 193 AD. Um, and they were after Commodus, we had Pertinax, then we had Didius Julianus, we had Persinius Niger, we had Claudius Albinus, and we had Septimius Severus. All in one and year. So, all in one year. Wow. And so in general, the way it always works out, the guard would assassinate the, the would assassinate the emperor, bring somebody else in, and then uh, they would assassinate them. And so uh, Pertinax didn't last very long. It sounds to me like being an emperor wasn't as good a gig as it seems. No, it definitely wasn't. In fact, Didius Julianus, the one right after Pertinax, he actually they had the guard actually had a a, a bidding competition in the Senate. And whoever put up the most money got to be emperor. <laughs> and so. It gets and to be assassinated next. 
and then he's assassinated next. So yeah. he basically, or he basically paid to be assassinated. Yeah, you pay for the honor of being assassinated <laughs> next, but you get your visit on coins in the meantime. Right, right, right. Um, what's 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 interesting is that when Septimius Severus finally took over and ended this long rough year in 193 he lasted quite a while and then obviously we have the southern dynasty with his children caracalla and elagabalus after him that reigned so uh he brought stability to the emperor empire um and also he septimius Severus obviously was close with pertinax and so when he took power he actually had the uh part of the guard that assassinated him killed and then he started to uh, celebrate pertinax's life A lot of killing going on. A lot of killing, a lot of celebration going on. So this so, coin. Uh, so obviously any coins and gold of uh, somebody who only lasted less than 100 days in power is going to be rare. Um, my father has a favorite saying, which I would like to repeat, which is that uh, successful people minted uh, inexpensive coins and unsuccessful people uh, minted very rare coins or their, their coins are rare. So they're very valuable. And so if you're very popular or you last a long time, you minted a lot of coins. And so your stuff is going to be very common and, and, uh, and, and not make up for, make up with demand in this situation, you had pertinent didn't last very long. So he's unsuccessful and he only minted so many coins in gold. And so here's one in mint state condition, uh, came from an old Sotheby sale. And uh, obviously a tough coin to get. Also, in, in mentioning this, you know, whenever we, when I bring up some of these coins, these are all collecting opportunities. So, for instance, you want to collect the five emperors of 193. You don't have to do it in gold, obviously. Most people can't. But you can do it in silver, in bronze. There's all kinds of ways of doing it. And this is a very cool year. And you start to look at the history of just one single year, and you can collect those five emperors, and it makes a nice little set. And, uh, and so there's all kinds of ways of collecting. And I think that you can do it through the history itself. And I think that sometimes that makes up how to collect or how to create sets. I'm still trying to get my head around the whole success and coin. it is so counterintuitive, but yet it makes so much sense. If they were successful, they just didn't mint coins. That's, they didn't mint many of them because no, they, they weren't around for very long. No, if, if, they, yeah, were if they were successful. successful. Right. Right. Yeah. If they were unsuccessful. Yes. Correct. Yeah, and so, uh, in fact, I played that joke on my father not long ago. It wasn't really a joke, but I used his saying and he loved it because uh, he always makes this joke about his signature not being rare because he signs all of his 100 greatest books all the yeah, time. Yeah. And and, and uh, he, made it, he made a joke to me about it not being rare. And I said, well, I said that successful signatures. Successful. There you go. Uh, you know, yeah. they, they, they're not as valuable and he just broke out laughing. Well played. He understood the correlation. Well played, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So moving on to lot 236, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but cause we brought it up before we have oh, our Agmar yeah. in the bracelet. Yes, sir. So, um, and, and, and for, uh, for, uh, the people who, uh, on Facebook who said, you know, we had a debate about it and I'm always up for debates, but this is a very difficult thing to price. Uh, and some people said, oh, $115,000 is a crazy price. And, uh, and you know, it, it's so hard to, when you have to put that ceiling on a buy price, when you're really not sure what the market's gonna put out there. And it's not like you wanna be outlandish um, but there is some reality in the thinking and the reason we put it out at 115, and obviously we're not going to get 115. It hasn't sold. Um, we did get a bid, uh, of, uh, 65,000. So our next bid is 10% above that. And so that's why showing the, I think it's 71,000 or something like that. Yeah. Right. So it's, it's going to sell for 65 unless somebody bids to 71 and that's fine. Um, we took a shot, but that's the whole reason for the buyer bid. Uh, the reason we priced it at 115 is because uh, um, Loy sold a Eidmar last year that, in my opinion, was a piece of garbage. It was really um, corroded. Uh, style wasn't that nice. And it brought, I believe, 150,000 Swiss francs hammer, not including wow. their commission, not including the, and I thought, you know, the most it should be is 100,000. So, um, 
if one that has zero issues uh, can bring between 250 and half a million dollars and a crappy one with corrosion brings you know close to 180 or 190 with after all the commissions and stuff is 115,000 that much for a coin even though it's got holes it's pedigree back to 19 48 and published in 1955, as well in 82 in the Spring Circular. So most of these coins, most of these Ibmars don't have any pedigrees going back before 1970. This one does. So that does add, as we've talked about, adds a lot of value. So I don't think our price was out of line, uh, but it didn't happen and that's okay. I like this coin, but I have a personal connection to it. So yes, I just like do. it. Yes, you do. So, uh, and, and I got to take a picture with this, with the gold Idmar. So that for me so was the collection of hold timing. the, the entire collection of hold Idmars you owned. Yeah. Well, I just found out today that there were, there's one in a museum in Berlin that's hold. Oh no. So there is another one. Here. There you go. Your, so, your Louis Eliasberg moment went in smoke. Yeah. Went. Exactly. And actually, you know, somebody brought to my attention that uh, uh, there was a foray, which we've talked about forays. And you remember the forays, Mike, those are the ones that are have copper cores with silver washes that were ancient forgeries, but done in, in contemporary times. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it, the coin, the Eidmars that are forays typically go for a fraction of what the regular full silver ones go for. And there was one that sold for a hundred thousand, uh, hundred uh, ninety thousand dollars plus the juice. So it was over a hundred thousand dollars, which it's is fake. still very strong for a foray. Yeah. So um, there's been some debate on whether or not the forays were actually done by Brutus, because some a lot of them are done with official dyes. So it could be that Brutus was spreading his th silver and screwing his uh, his soldiers yeah. in the process. So. Um, you know, but it was well, he war, didn't last so. very long either, did he? No, he did not. Okay, see, there you go. But he was never emperor either, <laughs> so he ended up on the coinage anyway. He did, yeah. Which is something that he, he was using against to soldiers, right? Right. Well, and he and he put imp on his legend to show that he uh, had imperial titles. Yeah, so he definitely was uh, putting himself out there for sure. Um, and then finally, let's go to th lot 322. Uh, this is a Vitilius ass, but it's the plate coin in David Hendon's book, who we've had on the show, uh, the, um, uh, on uh, coins of the uh, biblical world. Of the Bible. And, uh, or the Bible, yeah. And um, so this is the very first time that Judea Capta was shown on the reverse of the coin. And so this is the first, he's, Vitilius was the very first emperor ever to do this. This was essentially the prototype for every Judea captive to follow after. So it's an extremely important coin and extremely rare as an ass, uh, which is the denomination of the coin. And, uh, and obviously the finest one that David Hendon could find because it made it all the way to a sixth edition. Uh, so it, with every new edition, if David finds a better coin, he will replace it. In this case, he's never replaced it. So this one and has then, a mint mark. What's that? This one has a mint mark. A mint mark? Yeah. The S. Oh, the SC. No. Well, the SC and then to the right behind Nike. Oh yes, it has. Well, that's part of the legend. Okay. It just continues on. Victor. Oh, okay. It's, it's it's just kind and of some of it is off the legend as well. So. Gotcha. But uh, there, you can see the little figure uh, kneeling down. Yes. Underneath, that's Underneath. that's that's Judea. So, so that's the very first captive, and um, this coin also um, came from a 1934 Ars Classica sale as well. So it's got an amazing pedigree. Um, it's the very first prototype for Judea Capta. So anybody who collects Judea Capta, if they don't have this type, and it's the plate coin in David Hennon's book. So it's about as great as they come. It will be selling. We did get a bid. And uh, and that owner will be quite happy if he's the uh, successful at uh, $20,000. It is an amazing coin. I mean, the detail on it is is quite remarkable. 
Yeah, and you know, we actually sent this coin to David Hendon to clean it because it was covered in layers and layers and layers of varnish. People had varnished it for, you know, decades and decades. And so he actually said he took off several layers of, of varnish to be able to get it down to the original surfaces. Wow. So, um, but he was uh, successfully able to get it all off. So, yeah. That says yeah, something. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, David's one of the best cleaners in the world. And so, uh, you know, sometimes when you have a coin of this kind of magnitude, you send it to the best. And so, yeah, very nice. Um, so anyway, that's our that's our sale. That's going to be closing on the fourth. There's obviously tons of other coins in there that are, I think, can be had for cheap prices. But that's for the market to decide. Agreed. And that's my last pitch. Now, um, Mike, I don't know if you saw. I've got the upcoming e sales. Yes. In no, I have those. Okay. So the reason I brought that up is not to really focus on anything in particular, but just to show that even though the summer months are slow. You can see just in July, you have on the right side, the way that Numus bids works, all the printed auctions are on the left side, all of the E auctions are on the right side. And you can see the tons and tons of There's E auctions of happening on a daily basis. And so uh, there- And that's in the always, five uh, days that are left this month. Right. You know. So there's always there's always coins being sold all over the world. There's always deals to be had. They're not the highest graded coins. They're not uh, they're not what I would consider public auction coins. But they are definitely coins that anybody any beginning um, collector can purchase without breaking the bank. That's quite a few. That's a lot of them. Quite a few. And this is just in numerous bids. There's obviously you can go to bidder, you can go to six bid. There's lots of venues where you can see all the different auction houses around the world. Most of the same portals cover the same auction houses, but there's a couple that don't necessarily end up in one or the other. So it's kind of good to kind of look around, go to newest bids, look, see what's there, go to bidder, see what's there, go to six bid, see what's there. And then you pretty much will be up to date on everything happening in the world. And, and there were, there were a lot of auctions there, so. Yeah, and that's not even auction season, right? Right, that's, that's just summer. What's going on? That's summer that's dead summer. drags. Well, that's that's almost on a weekly basis, you know. So, um, you know, and I, I myself go through them because I look for coins for stock because I can pick up things inexpensive, and if I can pick up things inexpensive, you can pick up things inexpensive. That's true. Yourself. Yes. So um, if I can make money off of them, then you guys should be able to buy coins, enjoy them and build a nice collection. Doesn't have to always be the highest grade. Some of you guys don't have all the money in the world and you're just doing it for the fun of collecting. And I, I love that. And so there's no reason why you can't pick up coins for 20 and 30 euros on some of these e-sales and be quite happy. Yeah, it's, it's really not about how many or, or how much. It's, it's really about <laughs> chasing them and finding them and and putting together something that you really well, enjoy. You know, nobody can guarantee the values of ancient coins going up or down. Right. And so uh, I think all you can do is buy a market, speculate, and build the best that you can for the money. And hopefully you're enjoying yourself the whole time and, uh, and leave whether or not your coins go up in value to the coin gods. <laughs> well, see what I, happens. I, you know, I, I have kind of a, a, what do I want to say? It's kind of like a, a, a theory, you know, with U.S. coins. And I say that collect something that you enjoy because, honestly, they, they tend to go down in price anyway. And so at the end of the day, if they all lost all their value, would you still be happy with your collection? And I think if you can say yes, right. you've won. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, I mean... I mean, this is kind of off the subject, but it kind of in the same realm is I used to play Dungeons and Dragons in the 80s because I was, as my kids would say, a geek. And so um, and so uh, I still have some of my original stuff. You know, I have my monster manual and some of my other interesting little tidbits. And uh, and I pulled them out of my storage area and I was looking through them. I have like my old modules and I'm like. God, are these things worth anything? And so I went and I looked up and they're like, you know, they're worth $20 a piece. And I'm thinking, oh, they're going to, you know, maybe my original basic manual is going to be worth like $500 or something. And it's like, it's worth $30. And at the end of the day, I'm just like, you know what? I, it doesn't matter to me. It's all, this is all just memories. Yeah. And it's know. good memories. 
It's good memories. Yeah. It's good memories. And so, uh, and, and the difference between that and coins is that coins are thousands of year old with, with a lot of history behind it. And, uh, and so, and, and, and our, and our great learning experiences as well. So, um, you know, uh, there's nothing bad that comes from collecting ancient coins. That's for sure. Or any coins for that matter. Uh, so, uh, but of course in collecting coins, the number one question that we get as dealers is how is do we it, know it's real? Yeah. Is it real? How do you know it's real? How do you know? I get this all the time. And so um, the short answer is, is that after, I mean, Mike, you, you and I were talking earlier about grading coins and you just got back from the ANA seminar mm -hmm. and they told you what for how long it takes to become a good grader? It takes about $10,000. Which is about what? Five years? Five years if you put 40 hours a week into it a week, every week. Now, see right. me working in a shop, I can count it that way. Right. right. So, yeah. But but the graders, it's grading services, they're doing it 40 hours strictly. <laughs> yes. And they're just so, grading. So you got to figure double that. So you're talking more like 10 years, you know, really to get fantastic at it. Sure. To put that many hours in because you're not going to get 40 hours in a week in general. So, um, and the same is true for detecting fakes. Honestly, it takes time. Uh, I can do with, with ancient objects too. You know, people will start to bring a piece out and before I even get it in my hand, I'm already telling him it's fake. And they say, how do you know? And I'm like, because I've handled these things for 30 years. I know what the fakes look like. I know what the real things look like. Yeah, it's like I sometimes just we have to, yeah, sometimes you have to look a little closer. Sometimes you have to get your magnifying glass out. Um, but when it comes to ancient coins, there are a couple of things that we look for. Uh, one is, is the coin cast? Uh, the only ancient coins that are cast are the series of Osgrov bronzes, which are these really large hockey puck like bronzes, <clears throat> excuse me, that are cast. Uh, but most or all ancient coins are generally struck. And so if you have casting flaws, meaning a casting edge on the edge of the coin, that's why we look at the edge of the coin, see if there's a casting flaw, you see bubbles on the surfaces. So, you know, anything that's going to let us know or give us a feeling that this was, was produced through casting, we know that's gonna be a fake. Another thing is um, weight, extremely important. That's why we'll always ask you, what's the weight of the coin? Because if the weight doesn't fall within the standards of that denomination, it's fake. It just can't, it can't be otherwise. You can't have slightly lighter or slightly heavier based on possible wear or porosity. Um, but in general, they're very, very, the ancients were very accurate. It was extremely important to them to be right at the, right on the mark when it comes to the scale. Well, it was, it was money. And it was really important. It had value, and, and the value was its main purpose. Right. And you guys have to remember, gold and silver were treasury coins. So the weight of these things were extremely important. Bronze, not so much. Uh, but gold and silver, 100%. I mean, bronze as well. But generally, bronze is from the size of the coin. You can pretty much tell it's a Cersei from an ass from a Duponius. But when it comes to uh, gold and silver, you know, you'll have, and you have to know the standards, right? Because if you're talking about Greek, you have uh, the Attic standards and you have, uh, you know, other Greek standards as well. So you have to know what the standard was for that particular period in the weights um, that they carry. And so if the weights are off, that's another sure sign that the coin is bad. Then we have style because the style of coin will often determine it, one, is it ancient? Two, it may be a ancient counterfeit uh, or what we call imitation. There's a lot of imitations being done. And so it, that were done by the German tribes and other uh, Celts. And so um, you have to then determine, is it, is, it, is it authentic ancient, thousands of years old, and is it an imitation or is it just fake? 
So, uh, and you're only going to know that by looking at thousands and thousands and thousands of coins. There was something called electrotyping that was done, that was done in the 19th century, and there's a specific production way that was done. And electrotype sell for, you know, people actually collect those, um, but they're fakes. And so if something has that electrotype style, we know it's fake. Uh, again, um, when it comes to die striking, uh, they are striking, they're making um, fake dies from original coins and then striking coins. And so they're actually hand striking them and they're, the die making is getting really good. Um, but again, if, if a lot of times what we'll do or you'll see um, is they'll find the mother coin or the mother, the coin that they made the die from that has little wear marks or little damages. And if you see that coin repeated several times in different auctions, you know that that was probably a fake coin that they made from that original coin. So at some point, one of the coins is determined to be the original and then they made a die and then struck coins. And there might be some differences in the surfacing as well that will give it off as being uh, a forgery. So, uh, Mike, I don't know if you're there. You may be already uh, the issue catalog. Oh, yeah. Let's go to the issue catalog. So, um, some of you may have seen it. Um, I've got a very popular video that I posted on Facebook back in 2018 that showed our black drawers. So, most dealers have what's called a black drawer, black cabinet, and that is where we put all of our fake coins. Uh, my father's been putting away and buying for because whenever he sees a fake, he asks, can I buy it? And basically, we take them off the market and put them into this black case, this black cabinet. And um, and the reason we do that is one, so we can teach. The other reason is we don't want fakes to be on the market. And so something that used to be done, uh, not as done as much as it used to be, but it's still done. If a famous auction house... Um, has a coin and then it's condemned and instead of withdrawing it they buy it in because they don't want to show that they have a fake in their sale because they're embarrassed or they don't want to um, save face they want to save face in some way that's actually really dangerous because if you then show an auction record for a fake coin that coin gets re returned to the owner now he has an auction record for it showing that it sold when it really didn't it was just being bought in by the auction house and, uh, and so you never know who's going to use that information later. And, um, and I can tell you that it's, it's happened. Uh, I had, I, I'm in an antiquity once I had a, um, we had a bronze uh, head of Aspasian that some people said was good, some people said was bad. And then when push came to shove, everybody agreed it was fake. It got put into a Christie sale by us actually. And that was kind of the final straw of everybody knew it was fake. And it went unsold because everybody knew it was fake. We didn't own it. We returned it to the owner. And then about 10 years later, um, I received a catalog from one of the clients I was working with who lived in Europe. And uh, there was the piece. And I went to him and said, you know, that's, we used to own that. And it was condemned as fake. And he said, no, it had it was in a Christie sale. I said, I know. We put it in the Christie sale and it went unsold, but everybody knew it was fake. And said, so so in that situation, they used the the fact that Christie's put it in the sale as legitimacy. And did the coin sell? Or did the It was an uh, antiquity. Or did the well, antiquity yeah, sell or did they take it off the market at that point? No, no, the collector has it. I just let him know what what had happened or inspired with it so he knew and uh and then it's you know, i wasn't involved it wasn't my piece i didn't own it i didn't own a piece in it but i had knew the history of the piece and so the point is is that it's better that you know christie's probably if there was enough talk about it at the time they probably should have just withdrew, withdrew it if they would have withdrew it then this client wouldn't have bought it years later because he was convinced that Christie's would never put a fake in their sale. And that's generally smart thinking, but not a safe assumption. Right. So, um, so here, if you um, look there, these are all fake coins in this little catalog. I had a bunch of these. These are in our fake drawers. And these are all coins that are 100% forgeries. 
Um, if you look at, say, like coin number on that first page, Mike, 10012, it's kind of down in the left yep. corner. Okay, so that's the Judea Capta. Um, and you can see on the reverse, it has kind of casting flaws. And a lot of times when a coin is cast, it, it's almost like, you know, you make a copy of a copy and the copy is a little bit softer than the original. Yep. That's what happens with a lot of these casts, right? Because they're cast from original coins often. And so um, besides the casting flaws, you'll also have a softness in the strike. And so uh, that's another dead giveaway, whether or not something is cast. If you look at uh, 10014 all the way to the far right. That's a coin of Otho, and that's a Cistercius. Well, there are no Cisterci of Othos in existence. So that's obviously a fantasy piece. Um, and uh, and so some, some coins were just made to be fantasies, and uh, they weren't meant to, 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 uh, to, um, to fake anybody over. But if you have a coin that just can't exist, that's never been recorded, then be careful. So in this so, particular case, what did they do? Did they uh, take a silver and mint it in bronze? No, here they just, somebody made a die, they carved it, and then they struck it because there is oh, no coins okay. of Otho. Um, there is ancient, we'll talk about it in a minute, but there's ancient forgers. Um, uh, Becker is one of them. Uh, uh, um, and from the 17th, 18th century, 16th century, where they were actually carving dies, their own dies, some of them fantasy dies, but they were carving them all themselves and then striking coins for collectors that couldn't necessarily afford the originals. And they, if you, and they were asked back in the day, you know, they didn't want any of their coins to be considered authentic. They weren't trying to pull the wool over anyone's eyes, most people, most of them anyway. And so these were just meant to be collector items. Um, there, was, uh, there was a situation uh, a couple of years ago where there was a, um, a, a Coliseum coin that came up for auction. I'm not going to mention the auction house because I don't want to get in trouble with anybody. But there was... Um, Coliseum that came up that had the same um it was the same dies as the paduant which is a 17th 18th century uh die cutter and um and yet it had a uh, a pedigree going back to I believe the 1920s from a big auction house well that auction house messed up in the 20s in my opinion and so they sold a counterfeit and then the auction house cited that auction and it sold for huge money. And uh, I had a client who wanted to bid on it and I told him I wouldn't bid on it because it was the exact same dies as these, um, as these early pageant pieces. And, um, and uh, they were carved by the uh, fake die cutter. And so how, how could it be original in that situation? And so um, sometimes you just have to kind of do your due diligence. And even when something, if something doesn't smell right, it probably is wrong. So you, after doing this for 30 years, after my dad's been doing this for almost 60 years, you get a feel for your gut is really what has you um, deciding whether or not a coin is right or not. And if you feel like it doesn't feel right, then don't sell it. Your brain is actually smarter than the rest of you, and and it can identify stuff that you may not be able to put your finger on it, but you just look at it right. and you're like, no. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, I'm looking at a pre-Columbian. I'm not very good with pre-Columbian, but I was looking at a pre-Columbian piece that somebody just had recently. They want to know my opinion on it. I'm doing research on it, and the way that the eyes are cut does, doesn't look right. The eyes were always cut all the way through on this particular mask, and it's not cut all the way through. It didn't have the kind of wear I would like to see. And so um, in the end, I, I don't think it's right. And so I wouldn't buy the piece, and I'm going to tell the client the same. Um, but in the end, people have to make their own decisions on how they want to proceed in life. Yep. yep. <laughs> so um, as always, there's a great article, and I could go into really talking about fakes forever, but the show only lasts for so long. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, like I always like to call them our own Mike Martz. 
did a great article in Coin Week. Um, and uh, talking about modern fakes, and he does go into and talking about that what i um electrotype fakes being offered but i personally don't like it i don't like seeing fakes being offered in any kind of ancient coin auction house i think we don't sell fake if it's a becker fake from the 1700s 1800s okay maybe i might offer it but if it's an electrotype from the 19th century i don't think i want to offer that because i think it's a conflict with the rest of the coins i'm trying to sell and I, I don't know how you feel about it, Mike, but I just don't think it's a good idea for a, uh, for any coin company that specializes in se selling original coins, selling copies. I think that it certainly would draw your your credibility into question and your motives. I mean, there are there well, are places I mean, there are places for copies, there are places for replicas, but when and I'll take, you know, our company, for example, because we don't have to worry about getting sued. So, um, you know, when, when you think of Harlan J. Burke, you want to think of, you know, good coins. These are ones, they're genuine. They're going to be, you know, they stand behind them. They guarantee them. So yeah, well, that's, they can that's, they can, guarantee, they can guarantee that something's an electrotype. <laughs> no, so. no, it's it's more of an authentic thing, though. It's like you know, where did you buy that? Well, I bought it at Harlem Burke. Oh, okay, right, right. I mean, they could say what well, you know, and they are collectible. People do collect these things because look, if if you can't afford to buy a Syracuse decadram, but you want to buy an Electrotype, then that's actually a hundred years old. Then great, you know, you that's going to cost you a hell of a lot less than spending fifty thousand dollars. So I understand the why people want to buy them. I just, as as somebody who deals in ancient coins, it's something that I've always had an issue with. I've never really wanted to look. I mean, you know how much value we probably have in our in our black cabinet, <laughs> just oh, to yeah, be sober dude. alone. Sure, you know that. Yeah, sure, I would love to sell those, but I won't right. because somebody's gonna. Some of them are excellent fakes, and some of them will fool fool. They have fooled us, and they've fooled other people and so um you know and we didn't even talk about gold and that's the other thing i didn't mention either is that surfaces play a big part right so bronze will have a specific look layers of encrustation on the coin um silver can break down and have uh crystallization um and so you have to look at those coins sometimes crystallization sometimes i'll take an ancient uh coin that's worn and they'll heat it up and restrike it and so they're using ancient metal but if you look under magnification, one way they can tell is if that crystallization is smashed down, then we know that they just restruck a coin over it. And so that's one of that's one of the indicators that you can have. So, um, but it, it, you have to have a good eye and knowing what crystallization looks like and how it's supposed to form. And um, and it used to be thought that crystallization happened after the coin was struck. Well, that's not true. You know, crystallization happens over thousands and thousands and thousands of years and so it could have been mined with crystallization already and struck with crystallized metal and so i mean that's possible and so it's you just have to know the way you have to be kind of a scientist and that's really what numismatics is about you're a scientist and you have to then understand um what the metal is supposed to look like and how it's supposed to react and 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 um and once you see that now gold gold doesn't age and so one of the hardest things to determine really based on weight and style, right? And so um, you have to really know your stuff when you're dealing with coal. It's very, very, very difficult. And so um, I know collectors that won't buy gold at all because of that. They'll only buy uh, bronze and silver because it's much easier to detect the ancient uh, quality of the metal. And so um, it, it's you in the end, you're going to always need an expert to help um, guide you. And um, if it takes 10,000 hours to grade, I think it could take 20,000 hours, 100,000 hours, say good 10 years before you really can determine fakes or not. And that's looking at a lot. That's not just looking at good coins. That's looking at a ton of fakes. I've looked at so many fakes in my, in my lifetime. Um, 
ancient coins and antiquities that you just get a feel for what they look like and what they're trying to do when they try to fake something. The one thing that I'll tell you is with U.S. coins, it's easier mostly because we all know what the coins look like. You know, with ancient coins, there could be something that you may not have seen yet or you may not have seen before. And you have to kind of look at it and evaluate, okay, does that look right for that era, for that emperor, for that style? Right, but the history also tells the coins, you know, what the coins are supposed to look like. Because if you have an obverse of one die from one emperor and you have a reverse for an emperor that happens 200 years later, right. well, you know that's a fake because sure. that's not possible. Or like the one that you pointed out earlier that there just weren't any coins made. Right. There was no coins made. Right. That's exactly right. That doesn't mean that a new discovery can happen, but when you see a new discovery, be weary. So I, I, I prefer to buy unique coins with old, 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 old pedigrees. Mm. It makes me feel a lot more comfortable. That's just me. Ancient coins so, with old pedigrees. They seem to be the best. Right, right. So, um, you know, now, you know, talking about, um, about auctions and about forgeries, the thing that I want to point out, um, in our Pearl of Wisdom is that you should always check the fine print because the devil is in the details. That's right. And, and I bring that up because, and I just posted this on Facebook today, is that I had a situation where I was bidding for a client in a Sotheby's sale in New York, and uh, their posted BP, buyer's premium, was 25%, and um, which is hefty, but I know a lot of you know, standard auction houses that deal in furniture and things like that and paintings, they're doing 30%. So uh, 25% is you know, kind of standard. It's in but, the realm. Uh, yeah, it's in the realm. And, um, but in this particular case, I got the bill and they had an upcharge of 1% of the hammer for what they called, um, what did they call it? Uh, they called it some kind of management thing or whatever. I don't remember exactly how they worded it, but uh, I, think it I questioned materials. about it. I think it was materials handling or something like that. Something like that. Yeah. And so they said it, it was for, um, operate basically operating for them handling the yeah for them handling everything and shipping it and and i and i'm thinking to myself well isn't that the same as the bp isn't the bp supposed to help with with paying for those things too yeah (laughs) it's like what's the buyer's premium other than commission it's like so and and it wasn't it wasn't the rules but i didn't see it and so i guess you have to read the fine print and but what this what sotheby's is doing essentially is they're charging 26%, but they advertise it as 25%, and then they throw this extra line in there of 1%. And because, you know, I mean, if you had, look, if you had a, it's to their advantage to charge a percentage of what it brings, right? Mm -hmm. If it was just for, well, we need to pay for, you know, um, the lights and do, and you know, the things people, are getting more expensive everything. and, sure. you know, and all this stuff. And so we're going to charge an extra $50 on every sale, no matter what the price is, but no, they do it on a percentage, 1% of the hammer price. So to me, that's just another buyer's premium. So, uh, and so it does it, seem to resemble the rest of the buyer's premium. Right. Right. And so, you know, um, in this case, it was like 300 Twenty dollars or something. It's a lot of money. I mean, we spent. I think it was like thirty-four thousand dollars for this piece, and uh, so you know, it just, you know, it's just crazy. And the other thing you have to realize too is a lot of these auction houses. I mean, us Heritage, CNG, most of the most of the ancient coin and coin um, auction houses, we ship all our items, right? We do it because one, coins are easier to ship in general. Um, but these auction houses, they don't have shipping departments. They have incoming departments that will receive all the shipping, but they will not send anything out. And so you literally have to have it picked up by an outside source and they make you jump through hoops because then you have to, you have to then fill out paperwork if the person who's the company that's picking it up to ship it to you is actually got the right to pick it up. Uh, and, um, and in this case, we bought a, um, a postcard that could fit into a FedEx box 
And so literally anybody at FedEx or anybody at Sotheby's could throw it in a box and it wouldn't have spent, you know, wouldn't spend more than five minutes doing it. But they're going to make me jump through hoops to get a postcard picked up from Sotheby's to be brought to Chicago. And um, and so, again, you know, you want to read the fine print. Um, Sounds I like knew, a giant CYA to me. Yeah, uh, totally. I mean, look, um, I'm bidding. I bid in the Premier auction. If anybody, we talked about Premier uh, in this show because they had. It's a French company. They um, are more of an estate house than they are a coin company, and they had a great coin collection. And uh, they said we don't ship anything. And uh, and luckily, um, I know another auction firm that's in the same country that is willing to help me out and get the coins for me so that I can then get them shipped to Chicago. And I told the, I was representing a client and, um, and I told the client, um, in fact, the, this company charged 30% commission and then they charged another 2% for us using the online service, two or 3%. And then, and I told my client, I said, you know what, I'm not gonna charge you because it's already outrageous and I'll, and he's a good client. And so I was doing him a favor, but now, you know, I've got to spend all the time to try to get these coins to him. And I said to him, don't expect them to come anytime soon <laughs> because it's yeah. going to be a long time. Yeah. The slow you boat. <clears throat> so you, you have to realize, you know, I was talking to another client today that when you use, whether you use me or use some other um, um, uh, dealer to represent you, uh, they're dealing with a lot of crap. <laughs> You know, we've got to make deals so that people can get their coins and we've got to deal with customs and we've got to deal with the auction houses and we have to deal with getting VATs removed and uh, making sure that the shipping is right. You know, I'll get a shipping rate from uh, like, you know, I'll buy like uh, something out of New York from uh, I dealt with manuscripts from some of these companies for one of my clients and I get the bill and it's like a thousand dollars for shipping because they have their, they, they, they pump it up. And then they're also adding on for the insurance costs. And uh, why have my private insurance? So I cover it on my insurance. And so, um, so I have the shipping removed and I have it sent on my own FedEx number. So it doesn't cost my client anything, um, you know, uh, or very minimal at best. And so there's a lot of things we do as dealers that individuals can't do that, um, that are gonna save the clients a lot of hassle. So for the amount of money we charge, whether it's me or anyone else in the industry that you use, it's well worth it. Yeah, it's money well spent. Let the experts handle the customs because getting stuff from country to country can be a nightmare. It is, for sure. You know, I mean, I, I had a coin I just bought out of London not long ago and uh it came in through dhl and they wanted to charge me 50 dollars customs and uh i decided to make a decision because there should be no tax because it's over 100 years old there is a percentage but it shouldn't have been 50 dollars, and that's what they wanted to charge me and in the end i just paid the 50 bucks because and i didn't charge the client i just ate it because i was you know it's a good client i was making it up on some of the fees and uh in the end, it's not worth holding up uh, a coin for a month because you're trying to get duties removed. Fair enough. So sometimes you just have to, you know, use your common sense and and do what makes the best sense. Uh, some 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 wars are worth fighting, and some are not. Pick the hills you want to die on, but that's a different pearl of wisdom. That is definitely well, and I don't want to be murdered by any of my troops, so you know. You know, so you're, if I keep on giving them what they, if I keep giving them what next, they need, you're not next yet. If I'm giving them the, what they need, then I don't have to worry about getting killed off yet. Well, speaking so. for your troops, you're not next yet. Thank God. Thank God. <laughs> so, um, all right. It's, yeah, it's been a great show, Mike. Hey, yeah, actually banged out another hour. People have, uh, have their money's worth on this one as well. So uh, I don't know uh, how we get to an hour always, but hey, whatever. You know what? It's it's content and uh, worth listening to. So uh, we'd like to thank everybody that helps make this show possible, and uh, to uh, uh, yeah, just everybody that helps and everybody that inspires us. Uh, you got anything else for us, Aaron? Uh, no. Okay. Uh, I wish you guys all um, uh, happiness and uh, stay safe. Yeah, so uh, thanks for listening, and we will talk to you next time on the Ancient Coin Podcast. 
with Aaron Burke. Thanks for listening to the Ancient Coin Podcast with Aaron Burke. We'll return with another episode soon. Meantime, you can join our private group on Facebook. Just go to Facebook.com and search the Groups tab for Ancient Coin Podcast Discussion Group and ask to join. There you can become part of our community, where we share and discuss ancient coins as well as the show, the ancient coin market, auctions, or just to give our own opinions on things in order to learn together. Join Aaron and Mike again soon for the next episode of the Ancient Coin Podcast with Aaron Burke.